my background looks a little different. That's because I'm recording today from my home in Mar a Lago. Huh. Normally, normally we record at the office, but uh, change of plans. It's Good Friday. Yeah, right. Had special location recording from a special location. So, if you were to sum up last quarter, which was a positive quarter, if you were an investor, how would you, uh, in one word or two words, how would you sum it up? Um. I would uh, maybe like methadone or something because we got te- temporary relief with uh, the Fed lending money to these banks that are they're having some solvency issues. So there was a temporary increase in liquidity. So I, I, the common analogy we always use is uh, this is more than two words by the way, but the the common thing we the common analogy that we use is the economy is like addicted to drugs, uh, constantly addicted to. To stimulus and liquidity and we kind of got some of that we were going through withdrawals and we kind of got a, a spike of liquidity so that's that's how i describe it that largely explains why the markets have been have been up year to date even though like yeah. banks are failing even though earnings are lackluster even though jobs reports are coming in light uh, the market's still up seven percent because we got that temporary spike in liquidity yeah if, I, if there was a if we were doing like a recap a documentary of last quarter and I had to title it. I would, uh, I would title it "Clipping Coupons," and not in the sense of uh, cutting things out of the newspaper to go buy, but just collecting the interest on in the bonds. I think that was the. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about. Uh, I, I say this all the time on the podcast, how we control risk on the way up. Sure. Yeah. And, and you have two types of investors. Um, you have those that chase, and you have those that kind of um, let things co- come to them. And I was talking with a very, uh, a very high level investor last night, uh, who's a client of ours. And he kind of said the same thing. He's like, you know, if you look at uh, what's going on here, the S&P 500 uh, is up a little over 6% for the year. It's at a point, it's level of where it was somewhere around May of 2022. Um, Yet since then, we are in a much higher interest rate environment. We've got banks that are failing. We've got companies that are tightening their belts. We're starting to see employment numbers uh, erode a little bit. Mm-hmm. And the, um, the Atlanta Fed just came out and they reduced their estimate for gross domestic product by 200 basis points. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was the, that was, I was going to talk about that as well. The, the Atlanta Fed numbers, yeah, the, the, they revised them. It was at 3.5% just like 11 days ago. And now it's at 1.5%. So, I mean, think about it just like before we before we do a deep dive. Uh, just think about it like from a valuation perspective, like the valuations are where they were, you said in May or give or yeah, take, we're talking about like the level of the, this is, this is um, like holding all else equal, I guess, because I mean, some, some valuations are up, some valuations are down, but on average, uh, the market's at around 4,100 and like none of the earnings multiples haven't contracted hardly at all, even though the, the certain Federal Reserve banks are projecting lower economic growth and probably i mean even more long-term thinking like the longer term gdp projections are probably going to come down here soon so controlling risk on the way up derek we uh have you ever heard of the hedge fund uh i know you have but maybe you don't play i can't place the name have you ever heard of the hedge fund long-term capital management yeah so they were uh, a very very large hedge fund back in the 90s uh, is when they were roaring. And what made them famous was, if you remember, they had a mathematical uh, formula. Didn't they have economists that like won Nobel Prizes? And they were like the smartest guys in the room. I didn't, it's funny enough, didn't they like make a movie or a book called The Smartest Guys in the Room about long-term capital? It was called, um, oh, no, no, no. Or was that about Enron? That might have been about Enron. No, it was something like that. It was, was, there was a book out there for sure about this. But they had algorithms and they had all sorts of, they basically were using math to tell them what to buy. Uh, and it was working great. And they had these traders that were worth tens of millions, hundreds of million dollars in some cases. And they had uh, much of their own personal wealth in this hedge fund. And then something happened in 1998. We had the Asian crisis, which sent markets for a temporary, temporary time in turmoil. And the, the thing that you have to t- consider is that long-term capital management heavily used leverage yeah. uh, in order to make their investments, which is f- which is funny, <laughs> funny with the name long term capital management, mm-hmm. and we're, we're leveraging out all these assets. Uh, so are all these bets. Can I take a, a quick 
just to provide a detail here. Sure. So what they were doing was they were basically like uh, taking quote risk free trades. That's what they were looking for. So and then they would make like maybe a five basis point spread and then leverage that up twenty to one to make a two percent return. So like uh, a good example, I believe it was Heresy Financial subscribed to his YouTube channel. Really good information. His analogy was like uh, Google Class A shares versus Google Google Class C shares and like betting on the arbitrage between those two. So it's effectively the same investment. But if one day Google Class C shares are up 1.05%, but the Class A shares are up 1%, you basically short the one that's up 1.5 and you go long the one that's up 1. And the, under the assumption that that will eventually converge because it's the exact same security. It's just offered mm -hmm. in a different bucket. So you you look for trades like that, and they're much more complicated trades, but that's just an easy to understand example. And then you would make like, yeah, one basis point on that trade, but then if you leverage that up 20 to one, and you get really, really good debt, or uh, really cheap debt, because they were very uh, well connected within the financial industry. Because, uh, I mean, like they were, yeah, Nobel Prize winning economists, and they, they were like uh, everyone see everyone saw them as like they were they were brilliant and like it was effectively risk free to lend them money, so they got uh, debt for really cheap and were able to make a lot of money on these like risk free trades and then they ultimately blew up because the risk free trades weren't risk free. Yeah, the the markets with that Asian crisis, the markets stopped behaving as they anticipated. Mm -hmm. So um, and let's be clear, they they were the smartest guys in the room. Mm -hmm. They were they were brilliant at what they did. But even that level of uh, knowledge about how market markets work and and picking up in, in inefficiencies and, and um, taking advantage of those, the market is is more unpredictable than we can possibly fathom. Right. So when we control risk on the way up, that means a lot of different things. You know, uh, before I get to that, Warren Buffett had a great um, a great quote on that one, and. It's, it's perfect in relation to, I think, the retail investor, because the retail investor was not in a hedge fund like long-term capital management. But I, I think the same, the lesson that, that we learned from that holds true, because many of these traders lost their life, their life savings, their, mm -hmm. much of their net worth in this. It bl this almost blew up the economy. They had to get bailed out. Like, they had so much leverage that so many people were on the hook for this, that it literally forced the, uh, I believe, I forget, all of the investment banks kind of like came together to bail them out. And, like, I, I, and the Federal Reserve, backed by the Federal Reserve. Right. And then an interesting detail was, the, I believe it was the one bank that wouldn't like chip in their cut. It was either Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns. But like there's like a, a, a theory that like the reason in 2008, oh, I forget which one it was. I, I think it might have been Lehman Brothers. But the reason they were allowed to fail was because they didn't like do their share during the long term capital management fiasco. That's mm. that's just speculation, but it, it's a it's a fun theory to play around with. Yeah, interesting. After that, all that thing collapsed, and those traders walked away with, uh, you know, losing their their net worth. Uh, Buffett said, "To make money they didn't have or didn't need, they risked what they had and what they needed, and doing so was a foolish activity." And I, and I think about this with, um, I've said this before on a podcast that this might shock some people, but I believe that the average investor, who is a serious investor, holds too much stocks in their portfolio. I think stocks are a fantastic investment, but the average investor. Uh, is heavy in stocks because a lot of times they are the long-term investor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then when the downturn happens, it's always worse than expected. What I mean by that is we can see a chart on paper and see that the S&P 500 lost 25%, but it doesn't hit home as it does seeing 25,000 leave your account or 50,000 leave your account, or in some cases, 250,000 leave your account, depending on how, how big the, the, the account was. So, And we begin to lose focus. We begin to... Um, in these instances, our biggest danger is, and if this is one thing that I think an investor can learn, they become within the top 5% of all great investors. And that is, teach yourself to stop moving your goalpost. Because, you know, we set out a plan, Derek, you're, you're going to retire in 30 years. And here's the things we're going to be in. Here's the strategy we're going to be in. And yes, those change, right? Because mm -hmm. the the stock, the stock, the stocks that we're investing in are going to change. The bonds that we're investing in are going to change. The real estate we're investing in is going to change, but the overall approach should be similar, right? And in that approach, we take into consideration that yes, as I approach retirement, as my time horizon shortens, so are the adjustments in my, um, in my the allocation within my portfolio, right? But what happens is uh, we go through these times, and 
you might have a 2019 2020 event where in your mind you're saying why isn't my entire portfolio in growth stocks like i should be buying more more startups more mm -hmm. um you know taking risk on this because this is where the money's being made and then uh you get a you get an instance like what we had over the past year and a half and you have clients that are saying should i be doing something else with my money should i be buying land should i be buying um you know real estate should i be buying something else and the cycle will change again and we'll be back, uh, back into a different uh form of growth some some different asset will will take off and the danger in that is always chasing that shiny object right because you're chasing it after likely after it always already has appreciated sure yeah, yeah. so that is that is the and, and i think every investor if they are um true with themselves me included uh, i have to stop myself from doing that right because i'll see some investment that looks uh looks at the moment to be oh this makes sense you know I just need more of my portfolio in gold. I just need more more of my portfolio in uh, treasury bills. I need wh whatever that might be. And that prisoner of the moment uh, kind of scenario is tough. The, the main thing that I think we can do to ourselves uh, to prevent that from happening is I, I personally think that the stock portion of the portfolio is what causes us to make the most uh, re irrational decisions because that's the most volatile. Mm -hmm. Long term, it's it has proven to be a great investment, but in the short term, it can create chaos. So I think I think the thing that um, satisfies that, Derek, is the the portion of your portfolio that's in stocks. If you can make sure that, uh, and this sounds really simple, if you can make sure that's money that you don't need in a couple of years, usually that is enough, right? Because if I look at my retirement accounts, a large portion of those are in stocks. But that's the money I don't need to pay a mortgage. That's money I don't need to uh, pay for my you know daughter's education. And while I pay attention to it. The ups and downs of that, even if it loses, you know, even if it's cut in half during a severe bear, mar bear market, knowing that I've got several decades ahead of me, that shouldn't bother me. Yeah, it's like what we were talking about uh, the last time we did a podcast about the banks with their duration mismatch. That's it's exactly the same thing that's going on here. Uh, like if you have, like, so growth, growth stocks, even even you could probably lump all stocks in this basket. Those are long duration assets. Those are something that you're parking money in for 10 years, let's say 10 years plus, uh, that money should not come from money that you need for to meet your short-term obligations. And then if it, if it is, if you're using uh, money that you need for the short-term to invest in long-term assets, that's where you get that duration mismatch. And it's like, it's the exact same thing we were talking about with the bonds, where it's like uh, unrealized gains aren't necessarily a problem, assuming that you picked good investments and like the banks pick treasury bonds, assuming you pick good quality companies to own. It's like that shouldn't be a problem if you can hold them to maturity, I guess is what you call it. So like the analogy kind of falls apart here. But um, mm -hmm. if you hold them for 10 years, 20 years and you own Apple stock, but it gets cut in half. Uh, in year two, that shouldn't affect you that much because you're planning on holding it for 10 years. And in 10 years, if you hold it, more than likely, you're going to be fine. So it's it's that's that's a big risk management pr principle is just make sure you don't have that duration, duration mismatch and don't use uh, short term money for long term investments. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I, to give you an idea of you know what long term is, we always think about long term uh, with stocks with five, 10 years. The actual time horizon for a stock, if you truly want to be, I don't want to say risk free because there's no such thing as that, especially with stocks. Mm -hmm, definitely. But 20 years is the mark where if you look at the data and this is just using the S&P 500. I love this chart. I know the chart you're about to talk about. I love that chart. Yeah. It, if I invest in year one, in the S&P 500, my bell curve, meaning the, the historical losses versus the historical gains, gains my bell curve is negative 37% or positive 53% in one year, right? I could experience any of those. Anything in between, obviously I could experience something outside of that uh, that is worse than we've had in the past or better than we have in the past. But that's the bell curve I'm looking at, and that's huge. If I go to year five, that bell curve narrows on the on both sides to 11% loss and a 28% gain. So over, if I'm willing to hold that S&P 500 for five years, m historically proven, my worst loss is 11% probably stomachable for most people. Mm -hmm. If I if I go out further to 10 years, my loss now only goes to 4%, 4.7% versus a 17.6% gain. And if I'm willing to take it out 20 years, this is historical information, there's never a period of time where I'm negative with that, with that number. Mm -hmm. The worst performing 
a period of time would have been a, a half a percent return within that account. Which would still suck. Taken, that would be... Which would, yeah, yeah <laughs> it would still be terrible. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But the point is... That would be um, investing in like the top of a market cycle and selling at a bottom of a market cycle to get that return over 20 years. Yes, Something like that, right. yeah. You'd, you'd have to be intentional about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> about, you'd have to be about really... About that half percent yeah. return. <laughs> yeah, if you would have sold it like so, 30 days prior, you would have been fine. <laughs> yeah. Or th- yeah. And, and, and that's why like... With me, like with my personal stuff, and I'm not saying everybody should do this, the the portion of my investments that are stocks, I buy, I tend to like dividend paying companies, but I buy companies that I intend to hold forever. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that's not, no such thing, right? Because companies change. But my selling, I, I would sell a position not because I thought that it had a temporary high point. I would sell a position because something has changed with your company. They're no longer competitive. There's something out there better. They've lost their competitive advantage. They're no longer innovating. There's problems with the management, whatever that might be. So um, how does like rebalancing factor into that? Like assuming, um, like let's say you're 5% confident, so you put on a 5% position. And then what if it balloons up to like 25% of your account? Like how do you how do you factor in rebalancing? To yeah, that that, that's a good problem to have. So I, I will yeah, I will yeah. trim. I, I mean, I'm not comfortable. I am comfortable with volatility, but I'm not. I, I get less comfortable once I get a position that's uh, you know 10 percent or more of my account, mm-hmm. and I begin to worry about that. I think ideally, ideally you'd want to keep it under five percent for each holding. But um, it's a good rule of thumb, I think. Yeah, but I mean, I'm more comfortable holding Apple at a at a larger percentage than I would um, AMD. Upstart or or yeah, upstart yeah or uh, or elastic or or snowflake or whatever you want to put in there. Yeah, definitely don't have more than five percent of your portfolio in Bitcoin. That's that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> who would do that? Yeah, who would do that? So Derek, uh, I think you got some in- interesting information for us today. I know you did a little research because I the question that I posed to you was, um, hey, there's a lot of news out there going with the. Um, the attack on the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency, uh, the petrodollar. How does that affect us today? How does that affect us 20 years yeah. from now? So where do you want to start? So mainly what I'm focusing on is the the short term, because I think there are some merits to the, the argument long term. But it seems like, uh, like Fox News, CNN both had segments this past week or maybe the week before about de-dollarization and how it's the end of the U.S. dollar as the Federal Reserve currency because uh, China and Saudi Arabia and Iran are doing deals for oil priced in the yuan. Like, so it's just very topical that a lot of these, uh, a lot of news outlets, a lot of people that talk about finance and crypto uh, are saying this is the end of the dollar in a very short short amount of time. And the, the craziest example is, uh, do you, are, are you aware of Balaji Sir... Hold on, let me get his name right, sorry. Balaji Sarini Vasan? I am not. Okay. So he was a former partner at Andreessen Horowitz, and he was the chief technology, of, chief technology officer at Coinbase. He's like an extremely wealthy guy. So caveat everything I say with... This guy's way richer than I am, so <laughs> so take everything I say with a grain of salt. But he has a he posted on Twitter and it went viral that he thinks Bitcoin will be worth a million dollars in ninety days, and this was maybe about two weeks ago. So uh, first, let me get your thoughts on that. Uh, how, <laughs> what's your initial reaction to something like that, where he's betting he sorry he bet a million dollars that Bitcoin will be a million dollars by. Uh, June or whatever. Yeah, I mean, maybe he's doing it as a promotional stunt. Maybe that's part of like an advertising because that obviously brings some some eyes and some viewers to a, a speculation like that. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, if you were asking me to, to do I believe in that bet, I would probably I would obviously I would bet against it because the odds of that happening I think are are uh, remote. But I would be interesting to hear his case on why. Yeah, sure. So uh, mostly his case is based around the uh, the bank the bank's failing. And he's basically saying that there will be a flight to hard assets, gold and and Bitcoin, obviously, if there's going to be that big of a move up in price. And because of Bitcoin's inelastic or yeah, inelastic supply and uh, the devaluation of the dollar that would have to happen to bail out all these banks that are uh, on paper insolvent. Because, I mean, on paper, all banks are insolvent because there's more uh, 
they owe more dollars than what they have or uh sure. and if, or th- if they were to force to come up with all of the depositors money at an instant they would not be able to do so and that's true for every single bank so he's basically saying if uh if banks continue to fail depositors will get spooked and they will rush to pull out uh, pull out all of their money and there will be like five banks that get saved and it's the jp morgan chases it's the the wells fargo the city groups the bank of america all of these will get saved but all of these smaller banks will be vulnerable and if you have your money in a regional bank, you're highly incentivized to pull all your money out and you're going to go buy gold or Bitcoin with it. That's that's his that's his thesis. Hopefully I did it justice because I, I don't want to uh, portray his uh, argument as a as a weak argument. I want to portray it as the strongest argument possible. But I, I think that's pretty crazy uh, to say that it's going to happen in 90 days again. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is focused on why it's wrong in the short term, but why there potentially could be a case made for in the long term. Okay, let's hear, let's hear it. I know that. Uh, so one of the things, um, follow me here, or you tell me where I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons why the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency, uh, what that means is countries use the dollar uh, for their trade deals, mm-hmm. and they also use the dollar, uh, the petrodollar. They use it to purchase oil, and that began. Uh, in the 1970s, where the U.S. would um, would buy oil from Saudi Arabia, and in return, uh, Saudi Arabia would uh, only do it in dollars, effectively, and only do it in dollars. And then they would take those dollars and they would typically invest it in treasuries, or, or they would yeah. you know, put, kind of put it back in our system, essentially. Yeah, I mean stocks, U.S. companies, and U.S. real estate as well. Uh, so yeah, that's that's. Um, that's kind of what cemented the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. We talked about that when we were talking about the the dollar milkshake theory, um, which was a really good podcast. If I do say so myself, you should you should go back and listen to that podcast. I really enjoyed uh, researching and talking about that one. But uh, real quick, I wanted to take a second about and talk about BRICS because that is the the main catalyst for why CNB, or CNN and Fox are talking about it. So BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. It was, oh, sorry. Uh, originally, it was just Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And then um, in 2010, uh, they added South Africa to that to that acronym. It was first coined by Jim O'Neill, who was an economist at Goldman Sachs. Uh, and they, the BRICS countries, are proposing a new currency. Uh, to, so in the short term, they're just focusing on doing trade outside of the U.S. dollar system. Uh, so China's buying oil from Saudi Arabia and Yuan. But I mean, ambitiously speaking, they're probably uh, they probably wouldn't be mad if it overtook the US dollar as the global reserve currency, but they haven't they haven't over or they haven't come out and said this is this is our, our end goal for, for the BRICS currency. I'm referring to notes and I'm also going to be posting charts on the video. So if you're not listening on YouTube uh, go to YouTube and you can you can look at some of the charts we're referring to. So uh, the first point I wanted to make was about global trade. So just in the Americas, so North America, South America, 96% of the trade was done in U.S. dollars. In the uh, so This is data from 1999 to 2019. In the Asia-Pacific reg- region, 74% of trade was done in U.S. dollars. In Europe, it was much less because of the euro, uh, tw- about 20% in Europe. And then everywhere else outside of those those three, eighty percent of global trade was done in the U.S. dollar. There's no sign that that's going to change anytime soon. The major reason why I think the the argument kind of falls apart is not because like the, so the the petrodollar system was really important in the 1970s, but now it is less important in my opinion because of the amount of dollar denominated debt that is settled globally. Um, this is a really interesting chart. It's the index of international currency uses, which is a weighted average of foreign exchange transaction volume, foreign currency debt instruments, cross-border deposits, and cross-border loans. In the U.S. has been 60 to 75 percent of these uh, international currency uses for the past two decades. So this is data going back again to the year 2000, uh, this, this chart right here. And as you can see, in around 2015, the, the Chinese currency started to creep up, but it's still less than 5%. So in other, other words, other countries uh, owe their debt in dollars. In order to pay off their debt, they would have to accumulate dollars in order to do that, right? Correct. Which would create a demand for dollars. Yeah, and there's $65 trillion of unrecorded dollar-denominated debt. So like if Mexico does a loan with Argentina, they will do that deal in U.S. dollars because 
let's say Argentina would rather have US dollars than the Mexican peso. So $65 trillion and global GDP sits around uh, like 104 trillion. So around 60% of global GDP is, is debt denominated in US dollars that would have to be settled in US dollars. Uh, so yeah, if there was, um, if there was a massive shift from the U.S. dollar to the the BRICS currency, they would be climbing over themselves to be to get more U.S. dollars because again, there's more claims for U.S. dollars than there actually are U.S. dollars. So I mean, that would send the DXY into the stratosphere. Fifty nine percent of currency reserves globally are in U.S. dollars, and this is this is actually like so. This is the lowest level in twenty five years. So there is there is a trend downward for how much um, currency reserves are in US dollars. But if there is a massive devaluation in the dollar, that would that would also devalue other currencies as well because those currencies are backed by US dollars. So it's not clear that, uh, like if Mexico went to pay off all their US dollar denominated debt, that their currency wouldn't also devalue by a similar ratio. And then they would have to like print more of their currency to pay off the US dollar denominated debt if they were gonna try to, to get off the US dollar system. Hmm. Do you think looking back here, you know, what catalyzed this uh, seems to be, well, there's a lot of things that catalyze this, but it seems to be putting fast forward with the Russian Ukrainian war. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the things that we talked about that uh, you and I were talking about on a previous podcast that appeared to be a misstep and potentially still looks like a misstep to me. And that was weaponizing SWIFT, essentially mm -hmm. kicking Russia off the SWIFT system, which forced them uh, not to be able to use dollars. Right. So sure. they had to go to go to uh, other places to do that. The uh, Chinese government is trying to bypass SWIFT. They have a system that's called CHIPS, I believe, uh, which is just a funny name, but um, and, and it's currently not being used in, in a high in a high amount. But obviously, they're trying to encourage people to uh, you know bypass the dollar when they're doing trades, when they're exchanging oil. So um, whether this is something uh, I think I agree with you in the, in the sense that in the immediate ter uh, the immediate results of this are probably nothing that is uh, worth threatening. But I would say that it uh, long term, I don't think how you could point to the fact that that's a positive that countries are trying to bypass the dollar. Yeah, for sure. And then one more one more point about the Russia Ukraine thing that you brought up. It's like all of the aid that we're sending to Ukraine. Ukraine's kind of a good example, but we say and we send aid all over the world glo or globally in in billions and billions of dollars. Uh, so if we give aid to Ukraine, now they're sitting on a mountain of dollars. So they're incentivized to value the dollar highly because, I mean, if you were sitting on a bunch of Bitcoin, you're incentivized to say, like, this Bitcoin's worth a lot of money or stocks or gold or whatever. Like, if you hold the stuff, you want it to be more valuable. So we give, all, like, billions of dollars of aid in other countries. So they have, they're rich in U.S. dollars. So they want, to, they want those dollars to have value. Um, but, yeah, the thing that saved Russia, like, they, they, been sanctioned before the thing that saved them was that they have a a commodity that's in really high demand they have the natural gas and the oil but i mean yeah mm -hmm. you could like if they didn't have that they would be in a much worse position and because their relationships with china have kind of uh gotten cozier i mean just this past week you've seen china be more involved in the the russia ukraine conflict and that that's one of the reasons why they the de-dollarization topic has come up is because China's taking a more like proactive role in global affairs and they're kind of like getting involved in in situations that don't really involve them uh, just like the US has been doing for like the past century <laughs> yeah the past century yeah. uh, sorry were you gonna what, say something what, yeah I mean the, the thing that's going to um, also have to come to play is in order for you know there's a lot of countries that don't trust the United States, right? Mm -hmm. But in order for uh, the Chinese currency to replace or, or to have a uh, some other form of multi-currencies to replace the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency, it has to uh, it has to be stable. Mm -hmm. And it has to show that it can can remain stable. Otherwise, countries are not going to do their debt in it and they're, they're not going to do their trades in it. Um, so that'll, that'll yet to be seen. But that's something that, the, that I think the Chinese government is going to have to be able to do as well. And I know that they've tried to uh, put measures in place to stabilize it. Yeah. And especially in the United States, it's very easy to like beat up on the United States because it's fun to do. And it's it's very easy because we make a lot of blunders. But it's not like China's in a much better situation than we are. 
like a, a number that I pulled is so the total U.S. debt to GDP. So that includes private and public sector debt is around. This is in the United States. It's around three hundred and sixty percent, which is insane. But in China, it's two hundred and ninety percent. And like, uh, so like all this talk about recession fears and how it's going to be a hard landing in the United States. It's not like China is going to have a rosy time over the next decade either. <laughs> and then on top of the fact, if we're just talking about currencies. In, in your Mexico, think about if you're not U.S. or China and you're trying to be the global reserve currency, like to get other people to voluntarily use the currency. You're, are you going to pick the one that's more top down controlled, less or more censored, more like because they're over the long term. China has the CBDC, but it's not as widely used. But that's ultimately their goal is they want it to be this, the standard for Chinese transactions as a central bank digital currency. So, yeah, if you're in Mexico. Are you going to pick the relatively more open, especially when you talk about like global dollars, because because of the euro dollar system, which is basically just if a bank in Mexico has U.S. dollar reserves, they can lend out those U.S. dollars, those U.S. dollar reserves and create U.S. dollars, because when you lend money, you're creating money because of the fractional reserve system. So you have to get people to voluntarily use the system. And I think that like a good analogy is like the the cleanest shirt in a dirty hamper because i mean like none of these are perfect because you're still <laughs> like i i borrowed that analogy from uh, uh brian johnson who was the the creator of the dollar milkshake theory um but i, I think it's a really good ex- analogy uh so like why yeah if you're in mexico why or i guess not in mexico i think globally in general you're going to pick the one that's the best of the worst because you're ultimately you want to be in the position where you print the global reserve currency because there's advantages to doing so. But yeah, I mean, it has to be it's, it's it would be impossible to, to top down control and like force Mexico to use the Chinese BRICS or the BRICS currency or whatever. It's just people will choose the, the freest currency, essentially. There's an article um, in the, the Wall Street Journal that um, the article is by Melina. Bengali. And in it, uh, it kind of goes over the history of the petrodollar. Mm-hmm. But in it, she makes a comment that made me stop to think for a little bit. And she had said, to your point, she's asking the question, um, is this overblown? Mm-hmm. At least, at least in the near term, is this overblown? And one of the comments she says is, in the past, you know, going back 50, 100 years prior to that, religion was used to keep the people under control. Religion was used to get the people to do what we wanted to do, to think where we wanted to think, to look where we wanted to look. And while for many, many people, religion is still uh, you know, top, top of the line for, uh, for wh- how they live their lives, right? Mm-hmm. But I think for a growing number of people out there, the media has replaced the religion as far as where they go to get their direction. What are they scared of? What, you hear of, you know, the, the, put the fear of God in them. I think they just, now they're just putting the fear in them. Right? And it's what stories put it being put out there, whether it's the, um, you know, has, has related to pandemics, whether it's related to recession fears, whether it's related to the global reserve currency. I think a lot of this is always is highly sensationalized. And it's done. It's doing that because that's how they get the, the That's how the media gets us to pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, did you read Ray Dalio's most recent book, which is like, I believe it's like principles for a changing world order. I didn't read that one. No, I'm. I like. I didn't read the whole thing, but I'm about halfway through it. Uh, it's. It was really good, and um, he had this really interesting kind of diagram, which shows. And, and this is data going back hundreds of years, so it's it's really crude data, but it kind of gives you a a kind of a, a crude working model about how these kind of things work. It'll show the leading indicators for a global superpower, and then the lagging indicators for like the first thing to break as they lose that top dog status essentially and then the first couple like you can imagine it'd be like education there's like a huge emphasis on education there's a strong economy and then like uh, when they're top dog like they have a very strong military they start to have the global reserve currency but then one of the last things to go is the global or no it was the last thing to go is the global reserve currency status like so great britain was the global reserve currency and then way after 
they were not the dominant superpower anymore. People were still doing trade in that currency because these things are extremely sticky and it's really mm -hmm. hard to get people to like shift into a new system. And like even even for people that are like super enthusiastic about Bitcoin, like they don't appreciate how long these things take and how like ingrained this type of stuff gets into the system because it's just like people are like water going down uh, going down a hill. Like they'll just follow the path of least resistance. Anything that like really shakes the status quo isn't going to, I guess it's, this is pretty generally speaking, but like it would have to be something pretty spectacular to like really jolt the, the status quo. Like most of the time it's super gradual and it's just uh, kind of flowing down the path of least resistance. But it, it's very rarely that things like completely do a 180 flip. And yeah. especially on this scale, like this is like the complete underpinning of everything you can kind of think about it like that is like what how we do transactions i mean this is for, coming from like an, an economics nerd but like the economy underpins mostly everything uh so yeah like this is this is super sticky and i don't think people appreciate how long and how how drawn out these things can get especially like no matter how bad the us dollar gets and no matter how much money the federal reserve prints it's going to be very inconsequential to like how sticky these things are interesting Good stuff. I think you did a nice job of putting that together for uh, people for as an easy understand to understand uh, view of what's taking place right now. Yeah. And then, sorry, I just wanted to include one more thing about uh, like China and their economy. I talked about this in other podcasts as well, but it's, it's really interesting about uh, like how they're not having the best of time either. In China, like they, like in the United States, we park our wealth in stocks, essentially like 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs are like the main way that people save for retirement. And then um, real estate. And people have equity in their, their own house, right? right. But in, in China, like they don't really park wealth in their stock market. They all park it in, in real estate. And um, mm -hmm. you'll see these like massive real estate developers. Like if you look at the size of real estate in China and the size of the stock market, I don't have the numbers in front of me. But um, so it's weird how they do their property ownership because you're not allowed to own property in China. You'll sign like a hundred year lease. You'll sign like these super long term leases. So people like property developers will build buildings with money from people that are signing these leases. So they'll build like, let's say, a hundred million dollar building, but only have twenty five million dollars in in apartment sold essentially and they'll be like oh we'll worry about that later the as the building gets built we'll cover the sure. rest of the 100 million and then if they don't cover the rest of the money they'll have like a half built building with no more money to finish the, the project but all of these people already gave them the money because they're going to live there and uh it's pretty easy to find on google just look at these like massive demolitions that they do with these massive skyscrapers in china and that's that's what's happening it's like these property developers will build these buildings and run out of money and then they just can't finish the project. But the people that were like going to buy the apartment already spent the money. So there's literally yeah. nothing what they nothing they can do except blow up the buildings. And it's a pretty wild scene. They'll they'll blow up like 10, 15 buildings at a time. These are like skyscraper buildings that they'll just completely total. It's it's pretty wild to see. Interesting. Yeah. I mean they have you you've seen pictures of like entire cities they built that just don't have any people in them yet. Yeah. Because they've built the buildings before the people for the demand for the people was there. Yeah, so just keep that in perspective is that like nobody's having a good time right now. Like it's like all the problems that the United States have, yeah, we have a lot of problems, but it's not like it's not it's not like China has a clear road to be the global dominator. Like they're having their own share of like very serious problems as well. Interesting. Well, Derek, where can people find us on social media? As always, thanks everybody for listening to the podcast. If you like it, like, share, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Watch clips from the clips from the podcast on YouTube at Crosby Advisory. Subscribe to the newsletter by going to CrosbyAdvisory.com backslash contact, and we'll see you guys next week. Derek, you have been doing a, a nice job on those clips. I know people have been commenting on them, so we appreciate the people who have. Uh, appreciate the people who watch them. So keep in mind that Crosby Advisory is a registered investment advisor in the state of Ohio and Florida and Texas. At any time, you can request our forms ADV 2A and 2B which go into the business practices and qualifications of Crosby Advisory. Today in the show, Derek and I mentioned specific securities, and that is not a recommendation for you to buy them or sell them. Do your own homework and make sure they are suitable for you. Keep in mind, investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. 
and you should carefully consider all risks and fees before making an investment.